If you're ready to experience more peace and joy in your life, if you want to feel more comfortable in your own skin, and if you're ready to discover and expand on your energetic gifts and personal power, you're in the right place. So here's your host, Kelly Sparta. Welcome back to Spirit Guides. I'm your host, Kelly Sparta, transformational shaman and spiritual coach. I am here, as always, on Mondays with my co-host and fellow spiritual coach, Joshua Radawan. And we are talking about mystical topics because it is Mystical Monday. And so today we are doing Namaste in bed today. What to do when your spiritual awakening hits the snooze button. And I have to tell you, my husband got up and went right back to bed today while we're making this thing, this, this recording. So he's sleeping right now. And it's it's 7.30 in the morning. So we're, we're up early. Josh and I are, are hardcore morning people, which is so weird because in college I was such a night person. Oh, my God. My whole life I was a night person. And then, you know, in my later years, I'm like, oh, no, mornings are good. You know, when I stay up late, I just eat. So yeah, I eat in front of the television. If I get up early, I do other things. So it works for me. I always tell my clients, I was like, if you want to start coaching at 6 a.m., you're going to get the absolute best me. But it has also annoyed most of my partners. You know, like I wake up 5.30, 4.30, and I am functioning at the highest level that I'm going to be functioning at all day. So Cassie's actually in bed this morning as well. She uh, got up, <laughs> went back. You know, I, I might join her when we're done here. I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste in bed today, man. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So we're we're talking about what to ha- what happens and what to do when your spiritual awakening hits the snooze button. So let's you you came up with this title. So I'm going to let you define what it means to have your spiritual awakening hit a snooze button. So you know, I, I'm reminded of a conversation I had with my uncle before I really even stepped on the spiritual journey, but I really think it's it's applicable here. Is you know he. he he talked about the journey of life, about being peaks and plateaus, right? And, you know, so, you know, like we have this climb, climb, climb. And then it's like, we, we hit this, we hit this point where it's like, you kind of feel like not a lot's moving. And, you know, like most of us are just really uncomfortable with that plateau. I know I am personally, it's like, well, I'm doing the things. Why aren't more things happening? And, you know, like when, when is this next level going to take hold? And, you know, so, so for me, it's, you know, like, it's simple. Be be comfortable with not doing anything and just enjoying that you're on a plateau and resting up for the next big push. But, you know, like that's that's easier said than done for a lot of us, especially here in America, you know, where we're so pre-programmed to just go, 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 go. So when, you know, we, when we slow down a bit on in, in any front, you know, especially when we jump on the spiritual path, though, you know, we, we feel like we're supposed to be just doing all the time and not giving ourselves those those periods of rest that are actually, you know, a huge necessity. And it's why you write integration work into into the, your programs because nobody else does that, by the way, because you know. Right. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say is that your plateaus are not plateaus. They are integration time. And so, you know, they, they show up at a time when you need to stop doing and allow yourself to integrate what you've already learned. And so this is one of the things. So, you know, I've referenced this several times, but I had a podcast before this one called Spirit Sherpa. It is still up and running. It, it Mystical Mondays posts to it, so it's still active. But there were there's over 300 episodes, 350, 360 episodes in there right now. And I talk to people all the time who are like, oh, my God, I've been binging. I binged a year in two months. And I'm like, what? (laughs) Did you sleep? And they're like, no, I'm not sleeping very well. I'm like, I know you are taking in the equivalent of a two hour class in each of those episodes. And you are not giving yourself any space to integrate them. Right. And so it's like, ah, and and sometimes not, not uncommonly, I'm also downloading information, right? So I'm, I'm talking in my, the energy that carries on my voice is delivering content to your spirit at the same time as I am delivering content to your brain, you need to take a break sometimes, you know, you gotta, you gotta give yourself some downtime. And, and, you know, if you're finding that you are binging a freak ton of podcast episodes, whether they're mine or somebody else's, you know, 
make sure that you're giving yourself some some quiet time in between so that you can allow yourself some integration because you're just sucking in information like it's going out of style. And you, at some point, your brain's got to sort it and categorize it and put it in whatever place it belongs in your brain. And it needs to do that. And your energy field needs to recalibrate based on what you've received and how it's changing the way you think about yourself. So, you know, all of these things are a good reason why you need to really honor the spaces when you hit those plateaus, right? Not to mention the fact that it's just tiring. It's a lot of work. Well, there's, there's a lot to be done and, you know, it's not small and, you know, you've got other things in your life too. So maybe you just want to do this. Right. Uh, and maybe you just want to be. So, it, you know, the I think the most toxic part of U.S. culture is the do, 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 do thing. You know, the I have to be doing to be valuable. Right. That is probably the most toxic piece of the underlying programming that we, that we get in the U.S. Right. And so I will tell you, when I went on Walkabout, I spent a month not working, not doing anything, and it took a full month for me not to be every 15 to 30 seconds going, I should be, I should be, I should be, and I'm just, I, being still was not an option, right, <laughs> for like a month, it took me a month to unwind from that eh, 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 eh space, and so, you know, there's, it is one of the most ingrained things that we have. And so it's one of the things ever since that time, and that was back in 2002, ever since that time. And have we talked about the walkabout on this podcast? I don't believe so. I mean, I, I think if you I don't have, spoken because I can hear you people going walkabout. Like walk yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let me let me take a sidebar there for a minute because that that would be relevant. So, walkabout is an Aboriginal term. And most people think about it in, in in regards to the Australian outback and the desert and all of that. And but in actuality, it's just you walking out into the world until you find yourself, right? And so, because I lived in the U.S. at the time and I had a car. You know, an, an Aboriginal, their home is in the outback, in the desert. So they just walk out into the desert until they find themselves, right? In the U.S., my home is, you know, cars and roads and people. And so I, in 2002, I spent a year homeless. I was living on the road. I, I would say in my car, but I never actually stayed in my car. So I was traveling. I was on walkabout. I was a pilgrim. And I went I lived on $350 a month of unemployment insurance and the kindness of strangers. And 95% of the people I stayed with along the way were people I did not know before I left. And so the universe just took care of me. It told me where to go and what to do and so on. So ever since that journey, and I, it took me 14,000 miles and almost a whole year. Ever since that journey, I have made it a really big priority in my life to make sure that I don't have that I should be, I should be, I should be, because that it took me a month to let that go was eye-opening and, and horrifying to me. I was like, why can't I just lay down? I need to just lay down. And I couldn't do it. I mean, I did it, but it was this constant state of I, I should be doing something else, right? It's that guilt. It's that I'm, you know, I need to produce to be, be valuable, blah, 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 right? So, yeah. It's like that. We just had to set a new rule in the house because I am that should guy still to to a degree. I'm, I'm more aware of it than I ever have been. Uh, at the same time, you know, still very much in the birthing process of multiple, you know, things right now. They all fall under the same umbrella. But, you know, like, so it, it is taking up a lot of my, you know, mental space. And, you know, with that, you know, like it, it also damaged my work life you know balance my home balance um and that was a major 
you know, issue that, you know, had to be addressed over the last couple months. And, 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 and in, in doing that, you know, we came up like, we don't talk about it after 3 PM now, you know, like after 3 PM, I might be able to, I'll work on it my own, but we are done talking about it because I now know that that is not conducive to the overall health of, of the home, home life. And, you know, I, I also honor about myself that I, you know, can be in that do it mode and, and, you know, as long as I can balance it properly, but you know, like I don't get as guilty about it anymore. You know, after doing the work with you, I, you know, I could sit, you know, like the, I still have to say in the beginning of the programs, the integration weeks were the toughest. I was like, what do you mean? Do nothing spiritual. I was like, what? That's my whole life. That's the business. That's everything I do. I was like, what am I, what am I supposed to do? And, you know, and I, you know, I, truth is to this day, I still don't have a lot of hobbies, you know, sp- <laughs> you know, so I mean, I watch, I want, you know, those are the weeks that I binge TV. And, and like, like you say, I kind of, I integrate through letting the TV watch me. And I mean, like you, you, you've coined that phrase and that is so, so true. I mean, like, I, I don't even know that I'm paying attention half the time. I am just like, you know, working the things out, you know, like letting that come into, you know, into my beingness. And I mean, it's, I, I, you know, it, it's so funny to talk about it like that, though, because of how, how spirituality, you know, a lot, a lot of people in the spiritual community perceive things to be, right? Like, to, to say that you could do integration time in front of a TV, you know, what for me was a personal resistance. Like, can I even do that? But, but the truth is, is that is, that is where I, where I do it. Cause I just, I, I tune out during that time. Yeah. My, my husband, Jeff and I were, out at a friend's house yesterday, there's a house on the market here in Boquete that's next door to them. And it's the same layout and everything. So, you know, my friend said, well, why don't you come over and take a look at our house before you bother the realtor to make sure that it's everything you want. Right. So we were over there and they live right on the Caldera River. And so we were sitting by the river and we're chatting and Jeff is gone. I mean, he is just gone he is in the cloud forest because the clouds were down and you you know you look across the river and it's nothing but mountains right and so the you know the clouds were down halfway down the mountains and in you know the forest across from us and the the sound of the river and the river's really high right now because it's rainy season and so it was very loud it's like sitting next to rapids and jeff i just looked over and he was just in such a happy place you know he was just in this oh And, you know, that's another place that you can go to integrate, right? Is you go out into nature and you just find your happy place in nature, right? You can do it working, you know, if you're, if you're a woodworker or, or, you know, something, not, not anything where you're using your brain hard, but where you're using your hands hard would work, right? So not that woodworkers don't have to use their brains. They absolutely do the, the angles and the numbers and all the stuff, right? But if you're at the standing portion of your project, you do not need your brain a lot for that. You know, it, it does so become that sort second of nature. You know, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, we had talked before, and I, I took seven weeks over the last couple months to to work doing a little construction, just because, you know, it's been a process. You know, like all of this has been a process, and that mindless labor was, you know, not completely mindless, not saying it's mindless labor, but uh, you know, I've, I've, I've done it for 15 years. I did it for 15 years of my life. So there's a, there's a comfortability and a knowing that, you know, I know the processes, so I don't really have to think a lot, but it was yeah. that time that I was really able to integrate, you know, like I, I disconnected from a lot of the things I was doing and I was like, Oh, you know, and, and things began to become more clear. <laughs> Um, for me, you know, I, we all have our own processes and we, we find that, but, uh, that, that is one that worked for me. I mean, I, you, you, you were telling me one time, what, what do you, do you cut up something? What, what do you do? What, what is, what's one of your processes? Oh, I have a, I have an art project I'm working on here. I, I'm saving my toilet paper and paper towel rolls yeah. and I am cutting them and flattening them and I'm turning them into a parrot, which right now has only been cutting them and flattening them because <laughs> I have to find the backboard that I'm going to put everything on and I've got to find a lot more hot glue because mm, it's going to take a lot of hot glue, but, and the paint that I like, but anyway, the process is very meditative, Right. It's just super simple. And, you know, we play games. You know, I have friends who love to board game. And so I'm like, yes, let's board game. We have puzzles, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, one of the other things that you can do is just finding a space where your brain isn't engaged, right? So, you know, I I have a lot of people in my life who have a hard time meditating. 
And I personally, it, for a while, I used to set aside time to, to meditate. Like 20 years ago, I used to set aside time to meditate and I got like really super into meditating. And, and then over time, it just sort of slowly fell away. And what has become my meditation for me is in the morning before I get out of bed, my brain, I, you know, when I become aware that I'm awake, I allow my brain to just float. And because I'm already in that theta state, right? I'm in that state in between sleep and, and wake. Theta, beta depends on, on the morning. But the act of just letting my brain float and, and occasionally I'll posit a question and be like, what do I want to do about this? And, you know, whatever. And you and I had a conversation a few days ago in which we were like, I'm out, right? My, I woke up that morning in my theta state going, yep, I need to quit this thing. And so I am actually in the process of doing that. Uh, I've told one person out of two and the other one I'll tell tomorrow uh, when we meet. But the clarity just came in. It was just like whoomp in that moment because I didn't have to think about it. I was just, what do I need to do? And it went, boom, you need to be out. And I'm like, I can be out. Okay. And so the meditation piece is helpful for integration as well, right? Because it gives you the empty space to not think so hard. And this is the thing. When people step into the spiritual process, one of the first things I tell them is you have to let go of the goal because all your spiritual and personal work happens in the now and goals are in the future, right? And the goal of always being doing something, always working on yourself, always evolving and growing is a toxic goal in spirituality, unless you include in the doing something an integration piece. If you consider integration doing something, then you can have that. But if you don't, then it is toxic and it will, it will burn you out and it will flatten you. And, you know, I can hear all the people out there going, oh, but it's efficient. I don't know. I could do it. I could power through. Yeah. It's like, stop that. Stop that. Okay. What happens because I am the queen of power through. Okay. <laughs> I have done that. I am so good at that. Right. And it is, it will damage you. What happens when you push through on your spiritual work is you, you shred yourself and then you spend three times as long recovering from the shredding as you would have just doing the integration. I feel like so you're it pointing is actually right at me. <laughs> <laughs> you notice my finger was bouncing around. It's because I was pointing at both of us because we've had, we've both done that, right? It's a stubborn thing. No, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Right. Well, you know, when you yeah. run energy the way we do, and when you just have that, you know, like your whole life, you've been in that. And it, it was from a childhood for me. Like I just had energy. So I, I didn't even recognize that about myself that I was, you know, when I was just working in the physical world and not the spiritual world, it wasn't a problem. Like I'd get up, I was tired at 6 a.m. I'm out the door and I'm working 12, 14 hours. No problem. But adding spiritual work on top of that, I, I, I mean, like you warned me so many times about blowing myself up and I'm like, what does she know about energy? <laughs> she doesn't know me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I come in I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I don't feel right. You know, some, something's going on here. Uh, so. Well, like, yeah, you're kind of shredded. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I had a, I had a student who I worked with when I was in Richmond and, you know, he was doing this practice of trying to purposely expand his energy field. And he was just like running and running and running and pushing and pushing and pushing. I was like, please stop that. Please stop that. And he's like, why? I said, because eventually you're going to push it hard enough that you're going to shred your energy field. And that's going to take six to eight months to fix. <laughs> if, if you're lucky, you'll probably need some help. And he was like, oh, well, but I want to grow it. I'm like, just use it. Okay. If you use it, you'll grow it. Don't try and push it because pushing it will fry your butt. Right. And, and that's the story when I was, I was at Twilight Covening in Western Massachusetts, it was October. And we were, <clears throat> I want to say this was like 2006. We were in a, a ritual and we were the last group to go. And therefore they were letting the fire go out and the fire was the only source of heat in the room. And we're in the Adirondacks or uh, Adirondacks. We're in the, um, up in the mountains and I'm not coming up with the name of it, but anyway, we're, 
<laughs> in Berkshires. Thank you. We were in the Berkshires and we were, it, it, so it was, it was freaking cold. It was like 30 degrees out and, you know, we're bundled up and all, but 30 degrees when you're not moving in, in a building that has no heat, it's freaking cold. Right. And so I was sitting there going, I am always, I'm overheat girl. I overheat all the time. Right. I just, I run so much energy. I'm constantly sweating. And so I went, I should never be cold. And I turned my energy on and I was nice and warm. And I was like, Ooh, this is yummy. And I went, Oh, I'm running energy out my hands here. Let me see what I can do. And I touched the person on either side of me through my gloves, through their coats. And they each looked at me like what? And then their eyes blasted open as they started to receive the energy and warm up. And they were like, Whoa. And I said, touch the person next to you. And I heated everybody in the group in that moment for the entire time I could, I was in physical contact with them. So up until, you know, they took us out and, and then they put us together and I turned it back on again when they had us, you know, back to back, you know, hands to back and whatever. And so I ran enough energy to heat. I think there were like eight people or 10 people in that group. I ran enough energy to heat us all and shredded myself really badly. Right. <laughs> Because I was like, oh, this is fine. <laughs> it didn't even occur to me yeah. what I was doing. I remember yeah. hearing this so, story you know. early on from you. And I was, of, of course, I was like, I'll try that. You know, even though you're like, don't try that. <laughs> I mean, I didn't try eight to 12 people. I know I you know, I was very early on in the process, but I was like, not eight to 12 people. Uh, and I was, you know, you know I, I didn't. You know, it was like three or four people, but, uh, you know, it was early on, but I, I hear those stories. And I was like, I could do that, you know, but I didn't shred my energy no because I was aware from the story. So thank you for telling that cautionary tale. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking you're the, the little kid in, in the chorus line going, I'm watching Cisco pitter pat. Don't bump bump sit. I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> you know, the way I've always operated is right on the brink of chaos. You know, like that's where you, I mean, yeah. for me, I know that probably sounds insane to most people, but you know, like when I used to operate machinery, all of that, it's like, they tell you what not to do. And I was like, but what if you do it? And then, you know, so my, my <laughs> thing, is, and this is why I was the most efficient at what I did though. Like I'd push everything. Right one piece at a time one piece like just like one tick one tick one tick and then i'd find out what was too far and i was like okay that's the line and you know i mean because i i never really liked being told what i couldn't do <laughs> you know don't get me wrong i will i will take caution in how far i will push it it's not like i throw the you know throw it right into red right away i mean i have but <laughs> you know it's uh yeah. Yeah. you and i are very similar in that nature we learn the rules just enough to learn learn where we can break them safely. <laughs> it's yeah. like I actually did some classes for middle school students years ago, like twenty some years ago, to more more twenty five years ago, and they were they were the problem kids, right? They were the ones that the teachers didn't want them in the class. They had the cat class cut ups, and you know they were just disciplinary issues and whatever. And there was one group that came through, and you know their teachers were like, we don't know. We don't know if they're going to be leaders or criminals. And so I, they came into my class. I had them for six 45 minute sessions. That was, uh, you know, change your life. Six 45 minute sessions. And I was like, yeah, okay. So all I can do is teacher management skills. Right. <laughs> but you know, I looked at them when they walked in the door and I said, do you know why you're here? And they're like, yeah, we're in trouble. Blah, blah. I said, actually, no. Would you like to know what I was told? And they said, sure. I said, you're, your teachers told me that they weren't sure whether you were going to be leaders or criminals. And so you're here to decide. You want to think about that. Their faces were just like, Oh my God. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I just made it conscious for them. But you know, one of the things we talked about was, you know, the good kids get to do what they want to do because the teachers trust them because they learn the rules and then they learn how they can break them without getting in trouble. Oh, right. Picasso, right. Was that Picasso? Right? Learn the rules so you can break the rules. Exactly. And so, you know, the kids were like, oh, I'm like, yes, let's think about how we're operating. <laughs> Did you have any oversight right. of that? I would have loved to see the, you know, the principal's face when you went into that little. <laughs> no, thankfully not. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I told different things to different groups because it was different things that they needed, right? But, you know, if the kids learn teacher management skills, then then they do better in school and they are not disciplinary problems. And that's really all the school cared about, right? Is like, you know, okay, let's learn how to do this appropriately, you know? 
you know, I also gave them permission to speak the way they wanted to. And it was very interesting. The most interesting thing to me was at the beginning of every class, and I warned them that they were going to have to do this every class so that they would be have time to think about stuff. I said, you have to tell me one good thing about yourself and you can't use the same thing twice. I'm writing them down. And they had the hardest time with that question. And when I said, if I had asked you, now I didn't actually ask, if I had asked you to tell me something bad about yourself, could you have done it? And they all started telling me, listing things that were bad about them. I was like, stop. I didn't ask you to tell me that answer. I asked if you could have told me that answer. But they were, you know, this is the thing is that children in America get 437 negative messages to every three positive messages a day. And so, you know, big surprise, they had all kinds of things to say about themselves that were not so pleasant, but, you know, not so many good things. So, you know, this is the piece, right? We, we drive ourselves with this desire to achieve and accomplish and become and grow and change and shift and do all the things and be able to say, look, I did it. I'm, I'm good. Right. And, uh, you know, we shut ourselves in the process. So, you know, your snooze button is your friend here, folks. I just want to remind you. Yeah. Black trust holes. me. Spirit's going to push you. <laughs> Spirit will pl spirit will push you. And so if spirit's pushing you, you know, during the times that you are going up the mountain, you know, enjoy the quiet time. <laughs> and the helping hand. You need it. <laughs> and the helping hand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that too. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I think that that covers it for this week. So we will uh, see you next week on this show and we'll see you tomorrow on the tap in Tuesdays. And don't forget that what you focus on expands and what you intend is what you create. So choose wisely. <laughs> So that's it for today's episode of Spirit Guides Podcast. Head on over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen and subscribe to the show. Every week, one lucky listener who subscribes and posts a review on iTunes will be entered into a drawing for a $10,000 value grand prize and a private reading with Kelly Sparta herself. Be sure to head on over to spiritguidespodcast.com and pick up a free copy of Kelly's gift and join us on the next episode. Show of yourself.